Credit Suisse is one of the world's largest banks. It is so large that it produced $22 billion in revenue, operates in over 50 countries, and has $1.1 trillion in assets under management alone. However, in the last year, they have lost over $14 billion in two bad investments, have recorded five quarters of loss in the last seven quarters, and have laid off 5,000 staff. This, along with the pandemic, the Russia-Ukraine war, and the UK's economic crisis, has put this massive bank in Gita Party. This situation is so dire that analysts worry it will devolve into another nightmare like the 2008 recession. As a consequence, similar to Lehman Brothers in 2008, their stock price plunged by 60% in 2022. So, if this theory holds true and Credit Suisse goes bankrupt, like it did in 2008, it will produce one of the greatest recessions of the 21st century. What precisely is the problem with Credit Shoes? Why are investors comparing this to the 2008 Lehman Brothers catastrophe and most importantly, what study resources are available to assist you in better grasping the effects of this economic disaster? To comprehend the Credit Suisse situation, we must first grasp what is known as a CDS, or Credit Default Swap. People, these words may appear complicated and daunting, but don't be concerned. I'll explain it in such a way that even a 15-year-old can grasp it, so just stay with me and pay close attention. Now, as we discussed in previous episodes, there are private corporations that issue bonds in addition to clothing companies. So, Let's say a Danny Ports needs a million dollars or 10 lakh dollars in financing. And since they have such an incredible brand value, they will issue a bond and borrow money from ordinary people like you and me. But surely no one can give a Danny a million dollars. So what are the Danny's going to do? This $1 million bond will be divided into 10,000 euros. Each unit will be worth $100 and the Adanis will pay back the investors a 3% interest rate over a five-year period. So, when 10,000 individuals buy these $100 units, they're really financing the Adanis $100 individually and $1 million collectively, and Trisha is one of these investors, having purchased one unit of this bond for $100. So, initially the Adanis would pay Trisha and the other investors $3 at the end of each year, and then, after five years, they would repay the $100 principal sum. This is how a bond functions. Now, pay close attention to this. Assume that tomorrow there comes news that the UK and we both may enter a recession, causing a market panic. Trisha is now concerned that the Adanis may be unable to repay her $100. Similarly, other investors are concerned. This is when an insurance business steps in, telling Trisha that they will insure her bond for a 2% cost of the bond unit. So, if Trisha pays $2 to this insurance firm, if the Adanis are unable to repay Trisha $100 tomorrow, the insurance company will reimburse Trisha $100. This is referred to as a credit default swap, in which an insurance company assumes the risk on behalf of the investor whose Trisha defaults. If Adani defaults in this instance. Now, the issue we hear is, what is the advantage for the insurance company over here? When Trisha only pays $2, and receives $100 in the event of default. So, how does this benefit the insurance company? Simply put, 15,000 investors, like Trisha, will buy a $2 insurance policy to protect their $100 units. So, if 15,000 people acquire the insurance, the insurance firm will have $30,000 in its account. And only 100 of these 15,000 borrowers are likely to lose their money. So. The insurance company simply needs to pay $100 to these 100 persons, or $10,000. That is, they will still generate a profit of $20,000. So, it's the same as our regular insurance even here. To generate money, the insurance firm relies on chance. This insurance firm, by the way, might be any institution, such as an insurance company, a bank, or even a hedge fund. If this is apparent to you, let's see how this credit default swap predicted the 2008 pricing. So, let's go back to America in 2008. This was a time when there were many people in need of house loans and many banks eager to provide money. Assume there are five property purchasers, each of whom needs a loan of $200,000. As a result, the bank would lend a total of $1 million to these five house buyers at a 6% interest rate. In addition to that, Instead of giving out their own money, 
the bank will get $1 million from a wealthy investor named James, and then divide his $1 million into five parts as loans to house purchasers. In exchange, they would agree to pay James's 3% interest. So, did you notice what happened? The bank charges 6% interest to property purchasers, but just 3% interest to James. As a result, the bank's profit will be 3%. This is referred to as mortgage bag securities. In this case, the bank takes a bundle of loans and sells them to an investor, resulting in returns for the investors and profit for the bank without the bank spending its own money. So James is glad because the bank is taking the risk of finding creditworthy clients. The borrowers are happy because the bank is rapidly dispersing loans, and the bank is happy because they can still earn a profit with 3% interest without using their own money. Pay attention to this now. The bank management was concerned as additional loans were released. So, just like Tricia, these banks went to an insurance business and had a $100 bond unit covered for $2. Exactly like Tricia. These banks will pay a 1% charge to shorten their $1 million loan units. As a result, they would pay $10,000 in insurance for a $1 million loan unit or a $1 million mortgage-backed asset. So, if these property owners are unable to repay their loans tomorrow, the insurance company will have to reimburse the bank $1 million. This is exactly what happened in 2008, and the insurance firms involved were none other than American International Group, Bear Stones, and the notorious Lehman Brothers. So, under this scenario, even if the bank distributed $1 million, it is taking no risk since their loans are insured. And this is how the lazy German problem originated because these banks were able to have their loans insured for a fraction of the original amount. They became incredibly irresponsible and continued to lend to every Tom, Dick, and Harry. In fact, at a certain point, these banks were giving out loans so freely that a 22-year-old stripper was able to receive a $2.4 million loan and buy 10 residences in 90 days in 2007. And then something strange happened. Soon enough, like with our China episode, too many properties entered the market. There were more houses on the market than were required, and prices began to fall, rentals began to fall, and individuals began to fail on their loans. When this happened, the bank found itself in a cash constraint. So, what action did the banks take? They proceeded to the insurance firms to get compensated for the defaulted loans, but there was another issue. As it turns out, the insurance firms insured so much money that they went bankrupt. For example, if 200 banks paid a 1% premium to have their loans covered, how much income did the insurance business receive? They received $10,000 from each bank, for a total of $2 million. As a result, they effectively guaranteed $200 million in loans, while only earning $2 million in income. That is, with the money they had, they could only compensate two banks for their $1 million in default, and they had no money to pay the remaining 198 banks whose clients did not repay the loans. So, in summary, the likelihood was skewed. So now that the insurance companies were out of money, they had to start selling their own assets in order to pay the banks, and if they couldn't, they went bankrupt. That is precisely what happened at Lemon Brothers. They lent out so much insurance to banks and investors that they had created a portfolio worth $85 billion, which was four times the amount of its owner's stock, and they went bankrupt because they couldn't pay back even after selling all of their assets. And it was here, ladies and gentlemen, that the chain reaction began. When Lemon Brothers went bankrupt, most of these banks lost billions of dollars. Affluent investors like James did not receive their money back, and some banks and investors even went bankrupt, resulting in a cycle effect. As a result, real estate companies were unable to obtain loans, and because no one was buying houses, construction companies were unable to repay their loans. Furthermore, because these projects were unsold, these construction companies were unable to pay their suppliers, and those suppliers were unable to pay their suppliers, who were unable to pay their bank installments. People lost jobs, businesses went bankrupt, and it all snowballed into a disaster that resulted in one of the biggest economic crises in human history, wiping away $2 trillion of investor capital from the stock market. This is how the 2008 financial crisis occurred. Now, here's the question. Why am I telling you about Lehman Brothers, and how is it related to the Credit Suisse story? That's because one of the most prominent indicators of this risk was the percentage cost that Lehman Brothers was charging for insurance. 
So when they charged Trisha $2 to secure bonds worth $100, the percentage cost was 2%. And this is known as the Credit Default Swap Spread or CDS Spread. And the higher this percentage, the greater the danger of assuring the credit. And it is measured in basis points, with 100 basis points equaling 1%. So, if I state the CDS spread is 200 basis points, that indicates the insurance cost is 2%. Now consider the Lehman Brothers CDS spread. You can see that at a certain point it soared and reached 250 basis points, as in 2.5 in March 2008, and then the US economy collapsed. That is the most terrifying fact. Credit Suisse's serious spread is now 278 basis points, or 2.78. What does this imply? Several firms and investors, like house purchasers in 2008, had taken out bank loans and purchased bonds. And Credit Suisse has protected these loans and bond units using credit default swaps. So, when this serious spread is seen increasing, it indicates that the risk of insurance has increased significantly. And just as Lehman Brothers shares fell to rock bottom due to its increasing CDS spread, Credit Suisse has lost approximately 60% of its market capitalization in this year alone. Although this analogy is overly extreme, we cannot overlook the fact that the Russia-Ukraine war has destroyed the market. Energy costs in the UK have already risen by 175%, the pound is devalued by 21.4%, and business in the UK and Europe is declining. That is, by the end of 2022. If the firms who borrowed from these banks default, the banks will have to turn to insurance, which in this case will be Credit Suisse and other large banks. And if they are unable to repay them, it will result in a calamity similar to the 2008 crisis. Why is this credit default swap so high especially for Credit Suisse? That is because, aside from the epidemic, the dangers associated with Russia and Ukraine, and the currency collapse. The bank has previously lost $9.3 billion, $5.5 billion by supporting two failed startups, Green Cell and Archigos. As a result, they have only been profitable twice in the previous seven quarters. This is why analysts are drawing parallels between Lehman Brothers and Credit Suisse. Because both were seen to be too large to fail, they both gave money to the borrowers, both in small quantities of risky assets. And although Lehman did not envision a war, Credit Suisse became entangled in a war, an oil crisis, a currency crisis, and even a pandemic. So, does this suggest that Credit Suisse is on the verge of a disaster like the one that occurred in 2008? As I have stated, even the brightest minds on the globe cannot forecast a recession, which is why, as essential as it is to compare the past to the present and keep a close eye on the market, it is also critical to comprehend the intricacies of the market. That's all for now, folks. If you learned something, please make sure that you click the like button in order to make YouTube happy and for more insightful political case studies. Please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you at the next one.